the overall cost of operating funds for the organisation. Um, within the same service group as the ferries is the big story. The big story is proving to be very financially beneficial to us. Um, the last couple of years increasingly so as uh, the business has been turned around and uh, that helps much that helps even further keep the cost of ferries down and helps helps us to keep those vessels on the water. Um, other areas of business support services clearly as you would expect and as each of you um, your, your home local operators will know focus has to be on value for money across all the services. And we made significant economies of scale already and a lot of that is being achieved through sharing our back office functions and sort of leadership roles between the combined authorities and the and helps keep the cost down for both organisations. Moving away from revenue, there is a capital programme. It, it, it has to be reduced next year, although if you include rolling stock, it's still extremely significant in its scale. The CA no longer funds merge travel to the extent that it can fund its own ambitious schemes. The focus of the merge travel capital focus pro program is very much on um, asset management, health and safety, contractual obligations, those higher level strategic projects, which is the long term rail strategy. They are um, they're, they're owned, if you like, by the, the combined authority strategic level and Merge travel, like all the other local authorities and transport generally, has to bid into um, in, in resources to try and secure um, the funding that we need for uh, the, the, the larger scale projects. The combined authority also is, is providing resources for us, of course, for the larger scale projects as well as we expect. In particular, to take forward the work on the development powers and respect of bus services next year. <coughs> so in, in summary, it is a balanced budget and it is one that will be extremely challenging on a number of fronts. But once again it does enable the transport committee to um, to, to, get, to get some assurance that Mersey Travel is protecting front facing services wherever possible and is keeping its pledges in terms of affordability of travel for users and connectivity for the wider city region. The risks around rail are very real, very real and will need to be managed. However, the overriding feature of the rail activity for next year will obviously be um, the visibility and arrival of the fleet. So just before I conclude, I also want to just say a little on Halton. Halton, as you know, sits outside the transport levy, so as such is, is, is neither a funder nor a recipient of most travel services. Well, the combined authority is the transport authority for Halton. Halton, so while at a strategic level there is considerable integration on policy, on issues such as highways and key route network, for operational purposes Halton still has essentially a separate transport arrangements. The CA discharges its functions in Halton through a differential levy, and that enables Halton to continue to deliver transport services directly to its own residents. And while we keep working on further service integration, the budget for next year reflects the continuation of the existing arrangements while we get into a position where we can change following further integration. So, in conclusion, the, the budget is as presented in the report, and the next step is for me and, and Sarah and all of us to take any questions that you may have. Well, thanks for that, John. I've got Gordon and Francis. Yes, Jim, thank you very much. Uh, we have some sort of recommendations and uh, that's something I can entirely agree with and if there's anyone who wants to speak that time but I'll be happy to uh, agree to those recommendations. Uh, I think the team's done a great job and managing to secure what is balanced with the financial uh, the, uh, the budget report. The, the only thing I would say is all the new analogy of uh, you know, musical groups that I think for our uh, meetings in financial planning is a bit more like a rolling stone going down there, going down a, a piece of water to be quite honest. So it's that medium term now for the few years ahead that I've got concerns in relation to that revenue budget and I'm, I'm sure you're acutely aware of those too. Thanks for that Gordon. I've got Francis then Chris then Steve. Mm. Uh, page 27 on um, where it says um, 
full of labels of the operational implications with respect to equality and diversity. It's possible that there could be a result, result implications for people who share a protective characteristic, for example, older and disabled people. I think it means that there are any changes to services associated with the budget that are not directly associated with this budget, but if there are any decisions that we need to take, we will of course have to be obliged to consider um, the impact on anybody with those protected characteristics, including uh, uh, people in the world or any other characteristics. There's not implied whatsoever within the budget report, it's just a flag up the and should anything happen, or should anything obviously needs to change, we would have to go back and test them against those uh, those criteria. Also, got another question, which is page 35, uh, program management office. Uh, employees weekly one up to five nine six. Uh, yes, it's been a significant investment in the Programme Management Office. The Programme Man program Office is the office that uh, basically is charged with making sure that the campaign programme is delivered on time and in budget. It tends to flex and contract with the size of the capital programme. A lot of those costs, though, are being recharged to the combined authority, the shirt between MERS and travel and the combined authority. So there has been an increase in the number of staff principally to serve the combined authority and the strategic investment fund. But whilst those staff are, if you like, on the books of mercy travel, they're being charged to the combined authority. Just one last question, uh, page 35, program management office. Uh,
the next move in local government finance and transport finance is to move money away from the metropolitan authorities to bolster the failing shires which are under Tory control. Northamptonshire, for example, a bus council. So the, the, the prospects aren't really good. So unless we make some tough decisions in the years to come, then austerity has got to go. And the rumours that austerity has got are nonsense. We are still facing austerity. Our, our citizens are still facing austerity. And we are de dealing with a difficult budget. So I would commend the officers for putting this budget together and getting us through. But really, really, we must all work together to have an end to austerity, fair funding, just anywhere near the funding that London got for our transport network would, would, would be fantastic. Anywhere near, we would be able to do so much more for our citizens uh, and the area. So I'm happy, again, to sort of, as lead member for finance, to support this budget setting, but be under no mistake, unless we have a change of government or a change of policy, either will do me, um, we face tough times in the future and we need to brace ourselves for them. Absolutely. Um, well, actually, I've just got a specific question in relation to page 26, and uh, specifically on supported bus fares um, and bus station departure charges. I've asked a couple of questions of officers prior to the meeting in relation to these topics, because effectively what we're doing with supported bus fares is increasing them by 10 pence. Although I understand from officers that it's not entirely clear as to how much revenue that will generate, despite John saying there that that will help maintain current services. Uh, and then with the bus station departure charges, we're looking not to implement an increase in charges for bus companies, which I understand could, could have generated around £25,000 for us. In, in the next financial year, so I just, you, you can understand why that doesn't sit particularly well with me, I'm sure with other members, so I'd just like some explanation around those two topics, please. Okay, taking the second one first. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll first. Okay. In respect to bus station departure charges, I think what the response actually stated was, there's no proposal in this paper to increase those, but we've already had discussions with colleagues from the finance team and there have been proposals we brought back forward to this committee which will review bus station departure charges for all operators consistently and we expect to do that before April as soon as the conversation is complete. But it's not ready to do so at this meeting, but we expect it to be revised. If not by April, then very early into that financial year. And on the, on the other point, um, all the things being absolutely equal, um, nothing else changes, and a 10 pence increase on the adult firm would derive us um, from the additional income in the region of £100,000 plus a year. However, the real price is that it makes, if it makes routes more, more routes commercially viable, then they could be commercialised, um, or, or more attractive to commercial operators, we could move either to a full commercial service or more likely a service that's a de minimis service whereby we subsidise an, op an operator. And that's why it's quite tricky to, to, to model it. But we build into the budget a kind of other things being equal um, straight line estimate, but it, that's, it, it's too crude because what we're, what in, what we're, in effect what we're trying to do is make more routes commercially viable or at least make them nearer to commercial viability. Um, because you know, if all routes were commercially viable, we wouldn't spend anything on supported bus. The strategy for the supported bus network is not to withdraw it. The strategy has always been to get more people using buses, so more routes are commercially viable. <coughs> people are willing to pay more commercial fares, in which case they can no longer require a public subsidy. And I'd add, add to that as well in the sense that the government. One of the things we're conscious of is in challenging budgetary times, any revenue increase can help protect some services that otherwise we wouldn't have the, the money to do. Um, obviously, any fares increase is never popular, never easy, but I would point out that the supported bus fare is still cheaper than that charged by Stagecoach, which is £2.20, and Arriva, which is £2.30, which we've always questioned as being 
more expensive than, than it should be. Um, in terms of the bus station departure charges, obviously we are looking at those in detail, particularly to focus on the environmental standards of vehicles. So in the near term, we hope that we'll be bringing back some proposals to charge a lot more for dirty old diesel buses and make sure there's an incentive to put cleaner vehicles out on the streets um, as well. If there's no further comments, I'll sort of sum up, although I've just spotted Tony. Some really difficult pain as we all know 
when there have been reductions in things like uh, subsidised bus services and we know just how vital that is for our communities that we serve. So I think the team has done it exceptionally well pulling together uh, the budget that we've got but I would echo the comments that many people have, have made accordingly that we really are now getting to a stage where it's very, very, very difficult ahead if things don't change and I believe and in a recent poll, 94% of residents in the city region uh, said this, that the only thing that can change that is a change of government. So if I can move the recommendations in paragraph two of the report, uh, acknowledging the fact there is a revised appendix C that has been circulated around the chamber, is that agreed? Excellent. And item number six is the quarterly bus update, and Laura, I think you're presenting this, of course. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for taking Of the 
Yes. Of course, yeah. I've, I've uh, put this to uh, to before. I've email, sent emails across before about this. Uh, I had a response to say that there was nothing wrong as far as they were concerned. Uh, but if residents are telling me they're different. Okay, we'll look into that and find out response back. Yeah, absolutely. I'll make sure we can investigate it according to Jeff, because that kind of concerns me too. What's he's pulling up at a stop, telling people at the stop that they're late and then you can't get on to drives on? Yes, Jeff. Um, the, 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 they won't stop at Eccleston. Sorry. Uh, they're saying we're not stopping at Eccleston uh, and they're just going on. And that particular day gets three buses a day. And well, f fundamentally, they should not be going off route like that and just sort of taking their own decisions of that nature. So we'll make sure we get that properly uh, investigated. Right, that you. shouldn't be happening in that, in that fashion. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, Chair. Thanks for the report. I, I suppose I'm just a little bit disappointed that there's only four paragraphs in the report in relation to to Avon uh, and, and what happened there. I know there has been verbal updates to this committee in the past, but I suppose what I'm looking for here is a bit of an element of self-reflection as to what we could have done more uh, in, in relation to the whole fiasco around Avon. It, it's no secret that indeed many, uh, many officers were aware of the, the financial difficulties that that particular bus company were, were undergoing. So I'd like to know a bit more about what officers and Mercy Travel could have done in order to, to well, not necessarily stop the collapse of Avon, but indeed attempt to, to make the transition a bit smoother. I, I was speaking to parents at Upton Hall School just last week, and I've heard stories of young school kids having their school day extended by around three hours because of the collapse of that particular bus company. So I just don't think the four paragraphs really does justice to the to the significant inconvenience that many residents are finding themselves in at the moment is in regards to Avon. Again, I'm sorry, I'm probably not the best person to answer this question because it is another member of the team who would need on this. But I mean, if it's something that members are interested in, it's something. Frank, do you want to? Thanks, Chair. I think, I think it needs to be recognised that we have to be incredibly careful in what we do in respect of the commercial position of operators. So if we predetermine that something may happen and take steps accordingly, that could actually um, precipitate something that may not actually have happened and then we become liable for the consequences of that. So it's an incredibly challenging scenario for us. I think what the team did is the minute that we knew on that first morning that the services were not operating, they did everything they could to reinstate services wherever possible, wherever practical. But I think it's also important to understand we did that in the context of the challenge of budget position that we're in as an organisation that's already been highlighted through this report. So we, we don't have access to unlimited funding to be able to say let's just replace these services. We put some emergency services in place immediately. But critically, I think it's not for us to get involved in advance of a commercial operator to find that they're in financial difficulty because if we get that wrong, it puts us in an incredibly sensitive situation. And I think the other thing as well in relation to the, the report, we need to be careful what we do actually say in consideration of issues of this nature. I think that's very well put. Thanks for that, Frank. Um, next I've got Steve and then um, Jean. Yeah, uh, it's another one of, you know, it's quite incredible, isn't it? Paul talked about the frailties of deregulation when it was a flagship Tory policy to impose deregulation of bus services. Uh, we are, uh, I'm afraid, in, in a, a world where we are, the, the, the frailties of some of these companies, they go bust, they go bust, and then we have to do as best we can to, to mend it. And I think we've done it. A valid job if, if people are interested. I think the figures roughly are we had to bolster that budget by nearly half a million pounds to replace as much as the Avon uh, structure as we could, um, and, and that was no, no mean feat in the financial circumstances uh, as described. However, there still are gaps 
Chair, as you well know, and I've brought issues here. I'm not going to talk about the local issue, I'm just going to try and reflect what a bus service can do to a community and some of the, the, the ripple effects and knock-on effects. I have been made aware um, that people are actually refusing houses in, the, in areas that have lost their bus services and we've also the A1 collapse. So if that continues for any length of time, one can imagine how a particular estate or group of houses could go downhill very fast if people see, seek it as a non-desirable place to live. So buses aren't just, you know, are about a whole fabric of, of life and network and when these services go, these vital services go and lead to isolationism, it's a big knock-on effect and I know You've met with, with councillors from all the areas where, that are affected and we're doing our utmost to, to look at the whole of the, the, the service and, and generate some solutions. But it's just a, 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 you know, a, a resounding warning to people that buses are integral to people's lives and we should be championing the bus service and local transport. And I thank the team for the work that they've done and many people have come out, out of this you know, feeling quite quite victorious, but there's still isolated pockets of our uh, network at vital times that we need to keep continuing to try and resolve. Yeah, absolutely, and, and obviously we will continue to keep working with with all the representatives and communities uh, affected to look at how we might be able to kind of continue to improve things in a very difficult budgetary setting as we've just sort of discussed. Uh, previously. The, the one point I would highlight as well is it for me it does demonstrate how um, the current model, if I call it that, where kind of profits from the very busy routes don't then go back into a general pot to help support stuff that's socially necessary, just don't work. And whatever developed model we um, end up recommending, we need to have some mechanism where there is some cross subsidy that actually means that the socially necessary network is supported by the successful, profitable parts of the network. That's how they do it in London, that's how they do it in the vast majority of successful big city regions globally. So we need to have a similar uh, principle and I think that can be done under a number of different devolved uh, options in the Bus Services Act. Uh, I've got John next. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for the report. My question refers to 3.41 on page 42. Uh, where it states that Moody's have all the bus and legal teams have been working together to improve the conditions of contract and support the bus services in order to incentivise quality and complement the LCR. Uh, myself, along with uh, Councillor Robinson and Councillor Patrick McKinnon to my right here, have been working on a social policy uh, strategy for the uh, for emergency travel. And I was wondering, does this, does this in terms of legal terms, conditions and so on and so forth, include social value considerations? E.g. to address the issue of social isolation, which has been talked about this afternoon. I'm just interested in your response to that, please. Thank you. I think in relation to the particular item of 3.4.1, what, what could we look to do there to make sure that the quality of the service provision is increased, all of the safety requirements around the individual operators are being enhanced? and making sure that if we're trying to promote the use of the bus to um, young people across the city region, if they're experiencing support and services that don't actually represent an acceptable level of quality, would not align in our support and service awards with the objective of trying to grow patronage on the network. So by, by increasing the quality standard thresholds that we apply, We've actually been getting very positive responses from the users of support and services <coughs> and from the, the schools and the parents associated with the use of those support and services to, to say that that increase in quality as something that has made them think about using the bus on a much more um, wider basis. It doesn't yet include the issues of social value in relation to the policy around the delivery of the service, but it's something that can be contemplated. You might come, Gordon. <coughs> Thank you for reminding me of that one. Um, yeah, I, I'm agreeing with Steve, that's not the point of uh, originally going to speak about. We're facing the same position in my world where they can just suddenly pull the plug out uh, to concentrate on other groups. And I think there is a, 
a great impact on uh, communities and neighbourhoods, uh, particularly around the uh, William Henry Street, Douglas Place, that area where it's a confined uh, area that's not close to any real amenity. So I appreciate that. Um, just to just to check on one of the points that's here on page 41 on little e is the way it is progressing and the planning. Um, what what I, I don't really know what this is uh, what this is all entails. Uh, I can see it's something that's being changed in the city centre that it's uh, got to go before the uh, planning for approval of what the scheme would be. Uh, but I'd like to know firstly that uh, we can be assured that there will be consultation with users about what actually happens because every time something's changed on the network into the city centre, I have residents that say to me, we've come from Pennsylvania somewhere and now uh, we, we can't access um, Liverpool 1 or something. So I genuinely just don't know what the scheme is, so I'm not trying to pretend that I've got any kind of user knowledge. And the page 43, the uh, 3.54, the stops and shelters that uh, are going to be surveyed, uh, those are on the key room network, because that's, that's laid out. A lot of the key room, key room network is mainly commuter types of traffic with not many uh, buses using them. So I don't know if, that, if, if that's my experience of where the area I'm representing, I don't know if all the other key road network is actually the same as that. So is it planned for a particular reason as that? Come back about that tomorrow. Okay. So it's not
without any kind of regard to the effects on passengers and, and hearing the passenger's voice. So you say, I don't think I've explained this maybe quite well. I don't think that this could be an absolutely fantastic scheme. I'm not, that's not the, the point that I'm making. But when you talk about the old city bus that was taken out, taken out I had complaints from uh, residents and people were saying, we can't get to the strand now. We all, that bus goes in. How, how are the residents? so we, they know where their routes will be going into the city centre or doesn't it change any of the city centre for the bus stop? I'm genuinely asking because I don't know. We will do that but obviously we cannot do that until we understand exactly what the change in the city centre may be and because part of that is subject to a planning application we have to wait for the outcome of that planning application before we definitively know what will happen next. So, so effectively we can't do any consultation until we know what definitively um, will happen in the city centre on its highway network and associated infrastructure. Okay. Okay. Do you want to add to that, Frank? If I put it next year, that's why Mick moved the director of integrated transport services as a DOE for this afternoon. He's upstairs with the representatives of the Liverpool City Council going through the current proposals for the city centre connectivity scheme. So yeah, the point's made is entirely valid. Tony and Marvie. I didn't get the answer on the key route tonight. Oh, John, yeah, good point. Sorry, Laura. And then we'll have uh, Tony and Patrick and then Marvie. Okay, so the Stops and Shelters Inspection is a new survey which has come out of the, the um, focus, the, no, the Transport Focus Bus Passenger Survey. So there was a drop in the customer satisfaction and we felt that this new inspection to try and lift that, that satisfaction rate. Really. I think because it's um, a new initiative, we're focusing initially on the key route network because that's some of the highest sort of traffic and um, passenger that will take on that. So I think it's just as a sort of trial, I'll just have to look first. The key route network also includes the sort of main bus corridor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 